we're off. Off you go. Um, so um, welcoming uh, Adam uh, Pemberthy from City Winery to talk to the class about service innovation in a crisis. Over to you, Adam. Thanks, Rebecca. And um, yeah, you're right. It has been a long time. This is this feels really weird, me talking about a new business as opposed to back in the advertising days. Um, as, as Rebecca mentioned, I'm a washed up ad guy. I decided that uh, playing with wine was a whole heap better than creating ads and, and tech and so forth. Um, I, I missed the space dearly. In fact, I was only just reflecting on it the other day that, uh, that you know, the advertising industry has probably been the best thing. Um, you know, that I could have done in my early parts of my career. Now, doing a bit of a pivot myself career-wise and getting into something like City Winery. Um, would love to hear if anyone has been to City Winery. Uh, maybe raise your hand or whatever you do in these, in these things. Um, but uh, City Winery, for those that don't know, is Brisbane's first urban winery. Well, I, I say kind of first um, a little bit liberally in that. Um, it, it's the first within the last 160 years. You know, Brisbane um, over the last last 160 years hasn't had any wine production happening in the city. But uh, early 1800s through to about 1860, um, we there, there was actually quite a, a, a rich. Oh, there we go. Um, quite a rich uh, wine production history um, in cities across the country. In fact, Brisbane had about 350 acres under vine across the city. So places like Nudgee, um, uh, Mitchelton. Uh, the Pullen Vale, Mr. Pullen out at Pullen Vale, uh, the Lamberts on Lambert Road and Indrapilly all had substantial grapevines uh, and vineyards and they were making what they called back in those days colonial wine, which would have been like a fortified style of wine. But this is quite common, you know, winemaking across the country was done in cities. So uh, underneath the city, Sydney Harbour Bridge, there was, a, there was a small vineyard and they were making wine for as one of many vineyards in Sydney at that time. For, uh, for the colonials that were, were pioneering Australia and in this case, Sydney. So um, what we're doing, you know, 160 years on is really just an, an adaptation of this. One thing that I can guarantee is, uh, is that the wine today is a whole heap better than the wine would have been back in the 1800s. At least I hope so anyway. Um, we, we, so, and this is where my marketing, I guess, experience and background kicks in. We, when we were coming up with a brand for our wine label, we la named it Gurla, which is a story uh, well, named after a guy in Brisbane um, called Carl Gurla, who was probably the last winemaker um, in the city. Uh, Carl Gurla had a vineyard where Doombin Racecourse is today. So if you're familiar with Doombin Racecourse, uh, over towards Ascot and so forth, um, he had a 14 acre vineyard through there where he was creating a whole heap of different wines. The thing that we liked about Carl Gurla was he was, um, he, he was not only sourcing fruit from his own vineyard here in Brisbane, he was uh, also driving out, or not driving, of course they didn't have cars back in those days, horse and cart out to places like Toowoomba and Warwick where he was buying fruit and then, uh, and then bringing it back to the city. Um, you know, something that we, we do today, you know, today, our philosophy is to buy fruit from wherever it grows best in the country and bring that fruit back into the city where we make wine for the, the good people of Brisbane. So, you know, we, we buy uh, Grenache from McLaren Vale, we buy Shiraz from the Barossa, we buy some whites from the Adelaide Hills, we buy all the weird stuff like Nebbiolo and Petit Vidot and things like that from regions like the Granite Belt uh, in Queensland where weird stuff seems to grow really, really well. When I say weird stuff, the European varietal seems to grow really, really well. And, uh, and then bring it back to the city on to, into Wandu Street in the valley, which is where I am today, uh, and, uh, and, and make wine, as I said, with and for the people. You know, only a few months before COVID, uh, which we'll talk, you know, no doubt about today, um, we, we had our first vintage members uh, come in and be part of the business, which is where customers come in and stomp on the grapes and are part of the entire process from grape through to glass at the other end. Um, one of the unique offerings that can happen here at City Winery. The winery itself, and for those that haven't been here, is, is the old Campos building on Wandu Street in the valley. So behind James Street, just up from the Calil Hotel. Of course, I encourage everyone to come down here, a bit of shame and self-promotion. Um, after you've finished your assignments, of course, uh, Rebecca, it'd be rude if I didn't say that. Um, but the venue is quite a long, long building. We, we sit beside James Street Market. So out the front of the building, um, to, to my right where I'm sitting today is the winery. So that's the barrel room. Customers walk in and, um, and you can kind of imagine a couple of big stainless steel tanks, um, a, a, an old manual basket press, uh, the, the cellar door where customers can buy wine, taste wine, buy, buy food and so forth. Um, and then about 80 or so wine barrels, which is probably about 10% of the barrels that we have. We've, we've kind of doubled or tripled in production the last couple of years. Last year, we didn't, we didn't increase all that much. 
um, thank God, with COVID. But um, uh, yeah, no, we, we, we traditionally have kind of doubled every year uh, and therefore the requirements for wine storage being big oak barrels has obviously increased. So th this is one site. We've got another site out at Virginia, which is uh, really the, the, the ugly bit. That's where, you know, the wine's made per se um, behind, yeah, where customers don't necessarily need to go to. It's, it's more of the factory, if you like. In the middle of the venue, we've got the private dining room, which is where I am today uh, in our cellar, which holds about, uh, about 1,500 bottles, if anyone can see my video. I'm not sure if you can or can't. Um, uh, it, it's got a long, a long dining table. We have this for private events and whatnot all the time. Um, and then uh, in the rear of the venue, we've got our restaurant, which is a fine dining restaurant called Fireside. Uh, Fireside's a, a degustation, chef-led experience. Um, you know, and, and I'll, I'll, I want you to keep remembering this word experience because I'm going to talk about this a fair bit today. Um, you know, experience for us from a restaurant perspective is unlike a, a traditional restaurant where you get served by a waiter or a waitress uh, and, and, and whatnot. In our restaurant, you get served by one of our winemakers and you get served by our, one of our head chefs or executive chef or sous chef. Um, the entire thing is curated around fresh produce that we picked up from our producers that week. Um, one of the things that we pride ourselves on is buying directly, as, as much as possible, directly from the farm gate. Probably about eighty percent of the produce that we serve in the in the in the food offering in this venue uh, comes directly from the farm gate. In some instances, we buy the entire uh, the entire farm and everything that's ready to wait every single week uh, and get it delivered down to Brisbane. One of the, as I said, the unique thing that we offer here in the Brisbane in the Valley. But um, you know, the thing that I, I, I get really excited about is, is really defining what kind of business we're in. Um, and I said this before, you know, the experience word's gonna come up a lot today. You know, we, we see ourselves, we don't see ourselves as a winery, we don't see ourselves as a restaurant, we don't see ourselves even in the hospitality industry. We see ourselves first and foremost in the tourism industry and our product is experiences. And our experiences come in two verticals in this place. Experiences come in food offerings and wine offerings. So when a customer comes here and hasn't been to this venue before, um, you, you would be expected to no doubt take some, taste some wine from the barrel if you showed some interest in a particular wine. Um, you might meet the winemaker. Um, you'll certainly get to taste a couple of our different wines and be taught about the process, hear about the guys and girls that we buy fruit from across the country. Um, hear about their stories. Uh, people like Sami Gilligan, the first Sri Lankan kid to be adopted into an Australian family, who now has the most immaculate vineyard down in McLaren Vale. We buy all of his Grenache every single year. You'll hear stories about uh, Peter and Judith, who are our growers, our, some of our organic growers down on the granite belt, um, that we buy all of their produce, as I said, every week from their farm and bring it back to the city. Um, you'll go into the kitchen, you'll see our four metre fire pit. You'll hear about the crazy guy that cuts the timber and brings the timber in every week. We go through a, a tonne of iron bark every single week in this place. If you come in for dinner, you'll, you'll no doubt you know, meet our chefs and they'll be passionately talking about um, the food in which we offer in this place and, and what's different and what's unique and how we've cooked it or how we've prepared it and so forth. Everything we do is geared towards an experience. The photo that you're seeing on the screen there is a wine blending workshop. This is where customers can come in and, uh, and blend up their own bottle of wine uh, under the supervision of one of our winemakers and one of our senior staff and walk out with their own custom bottle of wine that they label, that they put a cork in, that they wax the top of, that they can take home and share with their friends. Um, we do weekly wine and food pairing masterclasses, wine and cheese pairing exercises, uh, vintage memberships, as I said before, wine blending workshops. We're in the middle of developing a whole series of courses and so forth around wine education and whatnot as well. So. Um, we're not just a we're not just a restaurant. We're not just a, a winery. We're we're an experienced destination, and it's a critical thing in terms of what's really made this business uh, successful. And certainly was uh, one of the key pillars, if you like, of uh, during the COVID shutdown. COVID threw a spanner in the works, well and truly. You know, the the, the day that the shutdown was announced, um, I will never forget for as long as I live. Um, it marked 12 months for us to be in business. There's been two instances where I've, I've, I've had negative thoughts about this business. It was the day before we opened to the public, um, where I sat in the winery at about one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, just as we were getting ready to, uh, to get ready for the next day and to open to the public. Um, and, and I looked up at the wine barrels and I thought, well, if everything, if it, if it all goes tits up, at least I'm gonna die with a whole heap of wine. And I haven't thought that way until COVID. And I thought, holy dooly, this, this could be the beginning of the end. And we, we could, uh, you know, this, this, this thought um, may, may be come to fruition. But um, of course, I'm the eternal optimist. And, uh, and, and you know, that, that thought lasted for about 36 seconds. 
and um, and we and we we went pretty hard and to pivot as fast as we possibly could, and it was the best thing for our business. You know, we um, we went from you know serving customers in, around really nice tables that were handmade by an ex uh, an ex principal from a, a state school here in Brisbane, um, serving people great wine and great food to really a um, a glorified warehouse uh, where we were packing and, and shipping wine across the country. Um, you know, the COVID the COVID period for us was. Um, and, and I say this, I say this um, a little bit tongue in cheek, but but pretty seriously at the same time, and certainly not wanting to take away from all those businesses that have been impacted by COVID. But for our business, it was really the best thing that could have ever happened to our business. Um, and and you know, it's it's kind of weird, I guess, to hear people, particularly in the hospitality or um, or, or, or a game like this, where you know you do rely on serving customers food and wine and, and giving experiences and so forth. Um, but COVID for us was the, the the thing that really has changed our business for the better in so many ways. We uh, we we pivoted the business, you know, that first week. As soon as the shutdown kicked into gear. Um, the entire kitchen was redone to make it really simple for customers to be able to order and buy food delivered to their home. Um, staff that were, you know, on, on Tuesday, the week prior, serving customers at their table were now um, taking food deliveries all across Brisbane. Um, we, we did, uh, we, all of our experiences and so forth were reshaped into things that could be done virtually and whatnot. And as a result, the business actually did quite well during the COVID period. Um, you know, one thing that I, again I'm, I'm very proud of was the uh, the team more than anything. You know, the team um, did not stop. We we as soon as COVID kind of kicked in and, and we uh, and we, we we presented the guys with our thoughts on where where we were at as as a business. You know, the timing was awful. The timing was, as I said, 12 months into business for us, which is obviously the um, the, the the valley of death, as they say. That first 12 months in business. Um, and uh, so we just crossed that valley of death. We, we had um, just started vintage or, or kind of midway through vintage, which means that's the most expensive time in the wine production period. That's where all the fruit's coming in. That's where we're buying new barrels. That's where we're buying new tanks, where, where we're paying for freight, paying for storage, paying for winery access and so forth. It's the most expensive time of the year. Um, so there was more money going out well and truly than there was coming in. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we, we turned to our team and, and, you know, we hosted a number of ideation sessions with our guys to think about, you know, concepts like that you're learning in this class, you know, um, design led thinking and, um, how do we reshape our offerings and so forth to give consumers an experience like they would expect in the venue, but in home. Um, and it was amazing. You know, I, I said to our chefs halfway through the COVID period, I said, you guys think like UX designers, you know, UX designers think about how the consumer engages with the product. Now our, our staff and our chefs were thinking about, well, how is, how's this customer going to engage with this dish? How are we going to make this dish as easy as possible for the consumer to reheat and serve at home with either their friends or their family and have a really exciting experience with that? And, uh, and, and so it was, it was amazing to see the team's journey through this period. Um, I, I certainly say, and I'll say it again today, you know, from our perspective, uh, our team, uh, including young Isabel, who you see on the screen there, um, was what got us through, through COVID. Not one person lost their job in this business. Uh, every single person has a job on the other side of this part of, of, of the COVID uh, period, which I'm thrilled with. Um, and, uh, and it was because of our team that we're still in business well and truly today and the ideas that they brought to the table. We, um, we went, as I said, pretty aggressively to, to pivot the offering uh, pretty quickly. I think, you know, this is one of the, the nice things or one of the, the takeouts, if you like, of my, um, my, my years working in startups and tech and so forth, that ability to think and to pivot fast um, and know that you need to, you know, adjust the offering. So, as I said, that first week, we, uh, we really pivoted our entire, entire business offering and so forth. Um, all of our experiences, things like wine blending workshops or food and wine pairing masterclasses or the monthly chef-led degustations that we did, we turned into in-home experiences. Um, you know, uh, all these things, you know, customers would dial in and, and would be able to buy a in-home food and wine pairing masterclass where they get three bottles of wine and a three-course meal with each course paired to the wines. And then a virtual Skype session with uh, or Zoom session with one of the winemakers or one of our staff to talk about how food and wine works together and why this was a perfect pairing and so forth. So we did these things. We did wine blending workshops and whatnot um, from the comfort of people's houses. And it was like extraordinary, you know, um, for, for us, whilst overall business was down about 45% um, across the board, 
um, you know, things like these experiences that we offer in this business, which I said is what got us through at the end of the day, um, grew by up to 300%, in some instances, nearly 400% growth. Um, you know, at one point we were doing um, about 100 plus degustations delivered across Brisbane every single Saturday night. You know, we would, we would have um, all of our staff out on the road with these polystyrene boxes taking meals around to, to our customers across Brisbane and people were using it to celebrate anniversaries and, and weddings and birthdays and engagements and whatnot. It was, that was, I think, you know, the really nice thing that came out of COVID for us is that consumers still wanted to celebrate their birthdays. They still wanted to celebrate their anniversary. They still wanted to celebrate the day that they would have got married. And, uh, and we created these experiences where um, customers could still have a unique offering and a unique experience from the comfort of their house um, and, uh, and still feel a little bit normal in quite an abnormal world, which was the COVID shutdown period. Um, we, uh, we, we, hang on, where am I up to? Um, the, the thing that I guess, you know, became abundantly clear for us is that as the market kind of, you know, got used to being in lockdown and, and businesses around us started to reopen and offer similar things to what we were offering. Um, some of the other restaurants around our, our neck of the woods started offering Saturday night degustations and things like that. We started to see a bit of a, a, a shift away, if you like, of the success that we were doing. You know, we weren't doing 100 dinners every, every Saturday night anymore. Uh, we might be doing 60 or 50 or 80 or, or whatever it was. Um, so we had to really get start thinking and being creative. So we started doing things like cooking classes. So this is uh, Chris, uh, one of my business partners in the business in one of our one, excuse me, one of our winemakers, along with our sous chef, uh, Adam Smart, or Sparkles as we call him. Um, and, and this is the guys doing a, uh, a, a gnocchi making class. So we were teaching customers how to make gnocchi from their, the comfort of their, 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 their uh, kitchen. Um, we'd sell them the ingredients pack with a bottle of wine that was paired to the meal that they'd be creating that night, or they could just pay for the course and, and, and have the ingredients at home to be able to make it themselves. We did kids cooking classes. You know, my, my boys are five and two, um, and so they were, they were living at home and, and learning from home, particularly Angus, my five-year-old, who was at prep, and, um, and all the parents were saying, you know, we're running out of things to do with our kids. And, um, and so we, we decided to do kids cooking classes called Short Chefs, and so we'd teach them how to make um, the world's best toasty. Uh, and we'd teach them how to make, um, you know, simple things that they could cook at home, pavlova and whatnot, um, things that, uh, that kids could do with the supervision of their parents. Um, and, and we saw great success from doing this. You know, whilst all these experiences would never replace the revenue we'd get from having customers coming into the venue and, uh, and certainly, you know, serving people by the glass and, 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 you know, plating plates and putting food in front of people and whatnot, um, it did allow us to get through the COVID shutdown period. Um, and as I said, you know, keep all of our staff intact. I think, you know, the thing from our perspective has been this post-COVID period and, um, you know, the, the rebound post-COVID has been something like you would never expect. You know, we, um, we're, we're up, you know, in some instances, 30, 40% Friday, Saturday nights, um, even with the restrictions and so forth. Um, again, it's probably been the best thing for our business in that we have now, you know, triple or three times the amount of customers coming into the venue. Um, I think, you know, the thing that stood out to us is that customers reacted and responded positively to the creativity that my team was showing during this period, coming up with these new ideas and concepts and so forth, executing them and delivering them out to our market. Um, and we, we hear that time and time again, you know, people that come in and they're now having dinner back in the venue uh, in a very COVID safe way. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, Four months ago, three months ago, they were having our degustations on Saturday nights and so forth. So it's been a really nice transition back to a whole new group of customers that we hadn't initially engaged with or weren't even aware of our brand um, uh, prior to COVID that now have had a really unique and interesting experience from their, from their lounge room uh, and have become raving fans and active customers in our business thereafter. So as I said, you know, COVID just seems to be the best thing for our business. And it doesn't kind of stop there. You know, for us as a business, as the restrictions have started to ease, um, we've, we've just continued to go harder. So um, you may have read in the media, we've opened, if you are following the City Winery story, um, you know, we, we have opened a new venue in the city. We've opened a pop-up cellar door on Edward Street, just up from Cartier and Gucci and all those fancy shops. Um, so we, we've opened a pop-up cellar door there, where, which is very much part of our COVID resilience strategy. You know, this is about dif differentiating, differentiating uh, dispersing and making uh, wine available to customers wherever they want to be. So, you know, we've got 
city customers, corporate customers and so forth that love our wine, love our story, love our brand, um, you know, we thought, well, why not take the brand and take the wine to the people? Um, so this will be one, hopefully, of many pop-ups that we'll start to do over the successive months uh, across Brisbane and across, you know, southeast Queensland, um, as I think this is a really interesting way, again, to really reach out and, and bring our brand to the people, if you like. Um, this venue in itself has been extraordinarily popular. We've, um, we had no idea that the city crowd doesn't go to the valley and the valley crowd doesn't go to the city. Um, and and there's, it's as if there's a massive split in the universe between the two. But, um, yeah. No, we've, we've picked up again a whole heap of new customers and now the guys are Ubering customers that have never been to City Winery in the Valley from the city uh, down here for dinner. So they'll pop into the Edward Street side of the CBD, have a glass of wine, talk to Isabel who's running um, uh, running our city site. And actually, I should, I should mention Isabel in a moment. Um, they'll, they'll speak with her and then say, where should we go for dinner? And Izzy will say, oh, let me put you in an Uber and send you off to the winery to have dinner at the winery. So it's been this really unique um, situation. Um, I, I mentioned Isabel, uh, Izzy, and she'd be embarrassed if, I, if she was listening to this, but Izzy um, has, is, is one of many uh, of our staff that just stepped up during this period and as a result is now um, running the Edward Street site for us. Um, Izzy uh, single-handedly would pretty well uh, manage the distribution of 100 uh, degustations every Saturday, Saturday night, all the food and wine pairing masterclasses, the wine blending workshops, schedule staff to make sure they are online at the right time to be able to do the, uh, the food and wine pairing masterclass virtual component. Um, you know, make sure that the computers were set up so the chef and the sommelier for the evening could, could host a live video with the customers that are doing the degustation, talking about the meal and talking about why what that food was paired to the, 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 the wines and so forth. Um, you know, it was people like this in our business that just stepped up and it was all of our staff that did this um, that became chippies or and fix things that needed to be fixed around the venue or delivery drivers or uh, in this instance, um, amazing at logistics. And I think, you know, the thing that was um, amazing for us was seeing these staff that, and, and, and finding all these un, these hidden talents that we didn't know that they had. And I think they probably didn't even know that they had as well, their strengths. And I guess one of the key things at the back end of COVID is, um, you know, th these things that we've dreamt up during the COVID period doesn't just stop at the end of COVID. You know, we, um, we're, we're in the process of creating a virtual wine experiences platform where consumers can give the gift of a wine experience to their friends, uh, just as you would a bouquet of flowers. Um, you know, give a, a in-home wine tasting or give an in-home wine blending workshop or give a food and wine pairing masterclass or cheese and wine pairing exercise or whatever it might be um, to, to someone as a gift. Uh, so we're in the process of formulating this right now, very much, you know, at, at the back end of, again, that COVID experience. Um, you know, probably one of the, uh, the things that um, I, I feel will differentiate our business into the future as well. And I guess, you know, to finish up, and I'm probably well ahead of time, I'm sorry, Rebecca, but um, feel free to ask any questions. Um, you know, we, we rattled on about this the entire time. I, I remember it was a day that uh, I was sitting in the kitchen with the chefs, um, getting them to talk to me about the menu. Tell me, what's got, what are we putting on here so I could put it all into the website and whatnot? And I was quickly trying to find a quote that summed up um, our position during COVID and, uh, and this one stood out to us as a team, you know, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. And I just couldn't agree anymore, you know, and I encourage you guys to think about this when, you know, we'll see peaks and troughs. We're seeing a trough right now with the most recent outbreak here in Queensland. Um, you know, think, think laterally, think, be agile, think, think about ways in which you can differentiate what you're doing, uh, create new markets, look for new markets, look for opportunities. Um, and certainly, whatever you do, don't sit still, I think is probably the, the key thing out at the back end of this. Um, guys, that's where I was going to leave today. Thank you so much, um, Rebecca, for having us in here. Lovely to meet you all. Um, I assume we're doing questions? Yep. Yep. Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick off first. Um, so, Adam, first of all, thank you so much. You're always inspirational. I have enjoyed very much watching your career over the last, I don't know, 15 years or so, or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> since you go from a young man basically into this uh, amazing entrepreneur um adam you have a business degree and you have mm. the soul of a marketer uh what do you think that brings to a business like this because you know you're not a winemaker so how what is it that you bring as a marketer here oh listen i'm a, I'm a good wine drinker Rebecca. Um, I'm almost professional. I wish I had a degree in that. Actually, I almost did get a degree in that. Um, I, uh, yeah, listen, I think, you know, businesses are made up of, of people. 
um, and humans and humans have different skill sets and strengths and so forth. You know, I'm not at any stretch of wine maker and I don't, I don't profess to know that much about wine, but I love drinking wine and I'm deeply passionate about it. And I think, you know, that's what, um, that's what, you know, I guess I, I try and bring to the business as much as possible is, is that, you know, enthusiasm and, and passion. Um, back in the advertising days, I used to have this, this line that enthusiasm fuels success and, uh, and that still rings true today. I think, you know, the unique thing for this business, it really is, um, marketing at its core, you know, um, and, and really any good experience destination, be it a zoo, be it a, um, a ginger factory, be it, you know, places like City Winery or a brewery, um, is, is the, the, um, the uniqueness in the story that is told. And I think that's what, you know, my experience from marketing and, and being active in the advertising industry for such a long time um, has brought to this business is that, you know, that um, all we do is tell stories. Um, in fact, we tell our staff that, you know, if a customer comes in and gets a, a glass of Shiraz, and if I had a glass behind me, I'll use this bottle instead. If, if you know, they come in and they get a, a glass of Shiraz and the staff member puts a Shiraz in front of them and they take the credit card payment and that's it. That's a really bad customer experience. You know, we want to hand over a story. We want to tell the customer about this label and that the label that triangle there represents the, the tent that Dave, my business partner, slept in for three months while he was making the very first version of this Grenache Mataro. We buy the fruit from, from McLaren Vale. All the Grenache comes from Sami Gilligan's. He was the first Sri Lankan adopted kid to come to Australia and so forth. And we hand over a story. And I think, you know, that's, um, that's the way we try and think in this business. You know, we, uh, we, we, don't, we don't sell products. We sell experiences. We sell um, stories. And I think, you know, a marketing background has been probably the, the best thing for me in, in, from that regard. Well,